So this happened about three years ago. The story begins with me having to replace a large section of drywall in my house, as I had a bad leak on the third floor bathroom of my house. I have a very trusted contractor that I've used and my family has used many times before. I've never had a bad experience. Either way, it's Saturday morning and I let his crew into my home. I pay no real attention other than saying a quick hello and opening the door for them to bring in their materials from their truck. I'm upstairs studying and minding my own business when my roommate texts me that one of the workers is possibly drunk. Now, a bit of backstory. There have been several times before where she has falsely thought that there are sketchy people on our block. We live in a city. However, they have always turned out to be construction workers or service people, so I wasn't exactly surprised. I text her back that it's okay because I've used this crew many times before and because it was in the morning, he probably wasn't drunk. She insists he is to me, so being the male of the house, I decide to check it out. I walk downstairs and notice there is one guy who isn't working. He's just walking around aimlessly amongst the crew without a real purpose. He is a large, well-groomed white man, dressed in clean baggy casual clothing. I go up to him and he mumbles some absolute gibberish words to me that I cannot understand, and I can tell that he definitely isn't drunk, but that he might have some intellectual disabilities. In my mind, it was a better than good chance that he was a relative of one of the workers, given that they seemed comfortable with him walking around the work area. Fast forward about two hours. I have to run to a quick doctor's appointment, and while I'm leaving, I notice that the guy is sleeping on the couch in the living room. On my drive to the doctor, I decide to call my contractor, who is at another site, to let him know that one of his guys or relatives of his workers was sleeping on the job. He's extremely embarrassed when I tell him and tells me he'll call his crew to take care of the issue. Fifteen minutes later, I get a call back while I'm in the car. In a very timid voice, he tells me that the person isn't with them and that they have no idea who he is. My heart stops and like a movie, I literally swung my car around and started speeding home at top speed. I immediately call my roommate to tell her to lock herself in her room and that he's asleep, so not to do anything crazy. I then call 911 and explain the situation. I arrive to the house and wait for the cops to get there, and was very happy that they brought two of the biggest guys they had. They enter my home and immediately question and remove him from the house. It becomes very obvious that he absolutely had no clue where he was, and after the cop told him he was lucky he wasn't shot, you could tell how scared he was. He apologized profusely to me and said that he was off his meds and was looking for a halfway home. He tells the cop he needs to get his bag, which he left upstairs. The cop obviously doesn't let him get it, but strangely makes me search for it and retrieve it. I have immediate flashbacks of Brad Pitt in Seven, so I wasn't too happy with the officer. Luckily, it was just filled with books. After this is all done, I go to do laundry and notice that this guy spilled detergent all over the walls and floor of the laundry room. I guess he tried to do laundry and forgot that the detergent goes in the machine, not on the walls. Also, cleaning up a gallon of detergent is nearly impossible. This takes place in the rural farmland of the southeastern United States. For those from around the area, you know there isn't much around except for old farmhouses, fields, and the occasional subdivision. When I was around 17 or 18, I was dating a girl who went to the same high school as me. Being teenagers, we needed a place to be alone, and what better than the front seat of my F-150? Often it was hard to find a place to park that was away from the road and was far enough away from everyone. One evening, as the sun was getting ready to set, I remembered an abandoned house with a long driveway and a tobacco barn off some old back road with no other houses. I'd been there before and explored the property. The house's roof had been abandoned long ago and currently had been used to store lumber. 
The house had no doors or windows left, and the rest of the property was clearly in disrepair and didn't appear to be used at all. I figured this long-forgotten property would make a good spot, so I drove my truck up into the driveway, far away from prying eyes. I put my truck in park, lifted up my center console, and put on the radio. As my girlfriend and I were talking, she suddenly stops with her eyes glued to the rearview mirror and says, Um, I think someone is here. I initially blew her off as I was fairly confident no one was around for miles, but I glanced in my rear view to see that a very beat up looking Ford truck had pulled directly behind mine and the door flew open. Out jumped a tall, dirty looking man holding what appeared to be a 30 6 with a weathered wooden stock. As I put my window down, the man advances, yelling all types of obscenities from the side of my truck. As he walks up, I hear the distinct sound of the safety clicking off of an older rifle. I froze as the world stopped around me. I'd never been held at gunpoint before. As soon as the shock wore off, I threw my hands up, and I see the man had his sights aimed on me through the rear window of my truck. I looked over to my girlfriend, who was frozen in shock and somewhat cowered into the passenger door. I remember feeling helpless and reaching for my pistol I usually had between the seats, which I quickly realized I had left at home. This was probably a blessing in disguise, as the strange man was clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have just sent him more over the edge. As my hands are up, and my girlfriend is shaking in fear. I eventually mutter out, What's going on, sir? The man, through rotten and missing teeth, shouts, You sons of bitches come out here tearing up my field and ruining my crops. He clearly had mistaken me for some of the ATV riders around the area who would often wander onto private property and tear up the land. Upon inspecting the man more, he didn't look like any of the farmers I'd known around the area having lived here 15 years at this point. I was fairly familiar with the local farmers. This supposed farmer looked maybe in his early 30s and looked to me more like the junkies I would see downtown. I replied to the man that I'd never been here before, nor that I was responsible for destroying his crops, trying desperately to defuse the situation. He wanted to hear none of it and continued to mutter while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize profusely and say, Sir, if I'd seen a no trespassing sign, I wouldn't have dared step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to open my window to yell, Didn't see no fucking sign. He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle tighter and mumble to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave when I notice he has completely blocked me in. There is nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, he perked up and dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose fight, but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get to him before he could shoot. Time seemed to slow, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted hours. He started to yell obscenities again, but he started to walk back to his truck. As he passes my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchanged glances. I had never seen a fear like that in someone's eyes, let alone someone I loved. I knew I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and put it in reverse as he does the same. The beat up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rearview mirror. As soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck into drive and stomped the gas pedal down as far as it could go. My tires squealed and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads and was confident I could outrun him if need be, as his truck looked like it was on its last leg. As the speedometer flew past 60, I could see the man following us, but enough distance from my truck that it would be hard to put a hole in my tailgate. My girlfriend is calming down at this point and is trying to rationalize what just happened to us. 
I drove and drove for several miles, constantly looking behind to see if he was following me. I briefly remember doing over a hundred miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab changed to utter disbelief as we talked how the crazy supposed farmer looked and awkwardly laughing off our near deaths. I never saw the man again after that and never returned to the abandoned house except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of the rundown property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man knew we were there, as we weren't visible from the road, nor were we followed. I personally think he was just some tweaker, as I knew most of the farmers in the area. And being in small town, you know everybody. I had never seen this man in my life, nor have I seen him since. I certainly was in the wrong being on private property and had heard horror stories of people running from crazed farmers as bullets flew over their heads. However, a couple of kids parked up in what was clearly a forgotten property. Several hundred yards from the nearest field shouldn't have warranted a firearm pointed at me and my girlfriend, who were sitting in a clean truck that obviously hadn't been tearing up any fields. Coming from a farming family and being close with the farmers in the area, the last thing you would catch me doing is tearing up someone's livelihood. Regardless, I put my girlfriend's and my life at stake just to park up somewhere and fool around. I never made that mistake again. My family is from a small town in East Tennessee. My father's side of the family seemed fairly normal. They were mostly tobacco farmers and were poor hillbillies. My mom's family, on the other hand, seemed like a disaster from everything I've heard. My grandfather would take my mom and aunt to bars and leave them in the car while he drank and wined women. He would beat my grandmother and berate her in front of the kids. My mother's side is part some kind of white European and Native American. My aunt, grandma, and grandpa all have dark black hair. My mother has auburn hair and freckles. My grandpa would call her a bastard and tell my mom that my aunt was the prettier daughter. My mom had even told me that her dad brought a drunkard home from a bar and that he did stuff to my underage aunt and forced my mother to watch. So, my mom had a good reason to want to escape home. During her freshman year of high school, she met my dad. He had gone to a revival at a church with his sister and started talking to my mom there. The preacher was a man called Gene. My mom and dad talked for a few weeks but were never allowed to date. One night, my grandfather came home on a bender and beat my mother. My father ran away with my mom and they eventually got married. The whole time, they kept following Gene from church to church as he preached. He was very charismatic and would preach for hours on end. He would become enraged and pant a guttural growl. He would be drenched in sweat by the end. My sister was born a year after my parents were married. I was born nine years later. My parents quickly indoctrinated my sister and me into the church after birth. The women weren't allowed to cut their hair. They had to wear dresses only and no makeup usual Southern Baptist dogma. Here's where things get weird. First was the ritual of getting happy. During the sermons, women and sometimes men would let out blood-curdling screams. The preacher would burst into tantrums and crawl around on the floor and speak in tongues. People would jump from their seats and speak in tongues while someone else translated. It all seemed like the run-of-the-mill Baptist happens on the outside. I started to realize things as I got older, and a few times I saw things that changed the way I feel about these people. My sister told me once, before I was born, that my father was chased by demons. He woke the family up in the middle of the night and told them that they had to leave before they were killed by demons, and that he had seen hell in a dream. My sister said, as they left the hollow where they lived, her dog walked in the middle of the road. He stood up on two legs and tried to block the car. My dad ran him over. My father was crying that he could see things climbing in the trees. 
they drove to my aunt's house and picked her up. Then they went to Jean's, where he calmed the demons and prayed them away. My sister said my mom would do odd things like build altars in the woods and pray at them for hours alone. I have seen my mother fly into fits of rage and lash out at me or my sister, then forget that they happened. I was always reluctant to get saved. I always felt like something was wrong. During heated sermons, I would go into the basement of the church and pray that God would get me away from it. The two major events that made me believe something evil was afoot will be burned into my mind forever. One night, when I was three or four years old, the congregation was praying over a sinner and helping them get saved. I was sitting in the back row watching. I felt the room get cold, and then I heard a growl the most deafening noise I've heard to this day. Then all of a sudden, the people stopped praying, and like zombies, the churchgoers walked back to their seats. The people sat there quiet for hours. Then we all got up and went home. The other event happened when I was a teenager. We had gone to revival in the middle of nowhere. The church was stifling hot. The preacher had gone into a tantrum, and the people were screaming and dancing around the room. I started praying and asked God to let me leave. The back door of the church opened on its own. I stood up and walked out, and no one seemed to care. My parents didn't even come to look for me until church was over. I had a dream once that I was in church, and the lights turned to an amber glow. Jean was preaching, he told the people to stand up and follow him. The people stood and followed him out the door. They followed him into the woods to a well. There, he marched them in a straight line into the well. I could hear hell coming from inside the hole. Lastly, there were the animals. They would come to the church and harass the people. The church was in the woods, so I didn't think much about it at the time. A bear would come and scratch at people's cars, and deer would roam around the parking lot. I moved out at 18. My mother threw a fit at me and hit me and screamed at me. I never went back to church there again. My sister still goes to church, but it's one of those mega church deals. They seem really friendly and way different from the other church. That's that for now. There's too much to talk about in one post. I know there are others out there who have escaped. Please talk to me. I know it's still happening. I am an 18-year-old female who used to live in Las Vegas before I moved recently. And if you don't already know, Las Vegas is number two on the sex trafficking list. I used to go out a lot at night to 7-Eleven and get snacks because I was bored and wasn't tired. The one closer to my home I got banned from, so I had to go to the one a bit further away from me. I used to go by myself and the walk there was creepy. Most of the street lights don't work and it's just dark and really creepy. This time I ended up getting ice cream and some kind of candy. Anyways, on my way back. I'm about to get to the crosswalk to get to the side my house was on. I noticed a guy standing outside one of the other apartment complexes. He wasn't there before, but some of the apartments are facing the street I walk on. He started yelling something, but I wasn't sure if he was talking to me or not because I was on the phone with my boyfriend. I crossed the street and walked past him. Something felt off when I crossed the street and passed him and he didn't say a word. The only time he said anything was when I was across the street. Maybe he noticed I was on the phone. I kept walking and glancing behind me, nothing too obvious, and then he started yelling and walking faster. That was when I knew he was talking to me and following me. I told my boyfriend and he said just walk fast and try to get home. This guy was pimped out. I mean he was dressed like a pimp gold chains, expensive shoes and clothes, and everything else. I say this because I didn't live in a great neighborhood, and you wouldn't see people dressed like that without knowing what they did. Anyways, 
I noticed that he was speeding up every time I looked behind me. I started panicking because I was genuinely scared something was going to happen. But another guy passes me. We acknowledge each other and say hello casually. The guy that was following me sees this and runs across the street. In my head, I was like, this guy probably just saved my life because he said hi to me. He was just a random guy I'd never met before. I got home safe, but I'll never get ice cream at night alone again. I still feel sick to my stomach, and I'm honestly so freaked out right now. I have every light in the house on. Anyway, here it goes. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service. Here in Australia, that mostly amounts to picking up orphan joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces, and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now, I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in the relative nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods. That's animals with pouches or marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went. Hell, why not? I got my rescue tub, which contains my essentials, and went on my way. The couple that called in the rue were at the entrance of the trail, and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs liked to play together, and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about, and I trust them. They offered to come with me, but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So, I politely said no, and that I got this. My area is very safe, and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So, I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve, and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic, he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilograms, more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities, so I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in the tub. I tie it with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area and in the Australian bush, I'm very used to the sounds of the animals in the night. The scratching, movements, hissing, growling, all that stuff. And since I had my head torch on the entire time so I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sound so well. I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago before I got sick, and when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right, and it sure is sure. Every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I'm on the balls of my feet. I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused, but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy. I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack and movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way too big and there was sudden silence, like whatever had made the noise had stopped or was stalking. I decided to just fuck it. I pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light, and started booking it down the trail sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it, and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't give a fuck. Luckily, it was mostly downhill, so I got there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then, I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground, 
that was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time, my instincts are screaming to run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that, even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night, and the next day she came with me to try and find my rescue tub. This morning, another rescuer came to take the sick root to the vet, and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it. The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like someone kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled cigarettes and a needle. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I'll be going out at night for a long, This story isn't one of mine, but it was told to me by my parents. My parents, one of my sisters, and I all own houses within a mile of each other in a very ritzy gated community in Orange County, California. It's called Codo de Katza. We always visit each other, especially when we have a problem or need help with something. I grew up in this community, and violent crime is something that's virtually non-existent. If it does exist, it typically is domestic violence within a household. I'm now 32, and my parents are in their mid-60s. While growing up, my parents made sure every door and window was locked, like doing so was some sort of religion. I always question this policy, asking, what's the point of locking all the doors and windows when we live out in an isolated suburb like this? Hell, there were many occasions where I didn't have a key, and literally had to walk miles to a friend's house or wait five hours in the yard just to be able to get into my house. It was quite annoying. Anyways, one night, one or two years ago, my parents awake to someone pounding on their door at around 2 a.m. after having fallen asleep watching SNL. My dad goes to answer the door, thinking it's my sister or me needing help. He opens the door without looking through the peephole. He was shocked to see a very angry 19-year-old male. The kid starts telling my dad that he needs to get the hell out of his house. My dad tells him that he must be confused because this is his house and not the kid's. My mom is in the other room hearing the back and forth between the two. My dad is apparently arguing with a very frustrated and angry kid to no avail, and it's escalating fast. The kid simply cannot fathom the logic that this house isn't his, and my dad has no way to convince him otherwise. Now, let me interrupt and describe my dad here. He's been an engineer his whole life. He may look old and nerdy, but he's always fixing cars, houses, electrical issues, building furniture, doing the yard work and such. He's actually still much stronger than me, as evident whenever we work on cars together. So, after about five minutes of circular logic, the kid, in a fit of rage, decides to barge his way into the house, and my dad gets into a scuffle with him. My dad is punching, pushing, and kicking the kid, and taking many blows himself. Finally, he was able to push the kid outside and close and lock the door. This is when the kid goes nuts. He decides to go around the entire house, pounding and banging on every door and window. My parents are scared shitless and are terrified that he's going to break through a window or bust down a door because he's pounding so hard. This is the time my parents decide to pick up the phone and call the cops. While waiting for the cops to get there, my parents are completely defenseless, having no gun or weapon to protect themselves if this kid is able to break in. 
My mom is terrified because they could never tell where he was going to start banging and kicking next. She described how she was amazed the windows weren't breaking because the kid was hitting them with extreme force. The cops finally get there. They find the kid in the backyard, banging on one of the back doors, and they have to taste the kid to get him to stop and put him in restraints. After a while, they were able to figure out what happened. The kid was extremely high on bath salts. The kid's older brother was supposed to be house-sitting for the neighbor next door, but the older brother decided to pawn it off on his 19-year-old brother, who proceeded to throw a party at the house that was supposed to be watched. At some point, he left the house and was so high on bath salts, he got confused on what house he was supposed to be house-sitting. My dad was bleeding in several places and was pretty bruised elsewhere. The cops asked if he wanted to press felony charges, but my parents said they were afraid to ruin the kid's life over an incident related to drugs. I thought they were being a bit too nice in this situation, but I guess it's their choice. My family doesn't talk very much about their emotions. Apparently, the realization that you cannot guarantee the safety of your home, even with religiously locked doors and windows, in a gated community, was quite upsetting to them. The psychological after-effects of this ordeal are pretty apparent, as they're coming out in other ways. For example, my parents installed a very expensive, high-tech security system within a week or two of the event, and I could tell they were rattled by this event for a while, but they just didn't want to admit the fact that the situation could have been a lot worse had my dad been traveling for work or not able to overtake the high kid. Oh yeah, another interesting fact of this story is that the kid who attacked my parents and his brother lived with their parents directly behind me, about a mile away from my parents' house and the house they were supposed to be sitting. I'm just going to include several experiences I had while delivering pizza for a popular chain a long time ago. I live in a small rural town in the southeast US and it has the usual suburban developments as well as some more outlying country in rural areas. When I was younger, just as I'd moved out on my own, I worked as a pizza delivery guy. These are some of the creepy encounters I had during this time. Story 1. The Orgy One afternoon, I got a delivery order for an area of town I rarely, if ever, visited. It was on the east side of town, which was very run down and poor. An old textile mill used to employ many in that area, but had been closed for some time and been overrun with kudzu and had begun falling apart. The houses around this area often had failing foundations and were very old, rusty trailer homes. This particular order was to one of the trailer homes. I knocked and no one answered. I tried again for several minutes as I could hear music coming from the inside and I figured maybe they couldn't hear me. When they finally opened the door, it was a skinny guy with no shirt on, and he asked me to step inside. When I walked in, there was a lady behind him who was wearing a robe, and another sketchy couple standing at the back of the room. They had a boombox playing loud country music. These people were high and drunk, which I was used to, but this place was buzzing with crazy. All of them were at least 10 years older than me, and as I sat the pizza down and waited for payment, they started making sexual comments regarding my body. Whenever one would say something, another would encourage them to continue. Eventually, the guy who opened the door walked over to me, and the lady behind him said, Go ahead and pay the man. He handed me the cash and put his free hand on my arm and in a hot breath of full natural light, he whispered in my ear and asked, We're all about to have sex. Do you want to join us? I said, No thanks, and made a beeline for the door. And story number two, The Creeper. 
I got two orders from the same area of town I talked about before. One was a 20 pie order for a church fellowship hall, and the other a single pie for a residence. I dropped the pies for the church off first, then headed over to the last customer. When I arrived, I immediately noticed the house looking off-putting, dark and dirty. I was like, please let this be the wrong house, but it wasn't. There was a creepy, old, naked doll on the porch, and an empty birdcage hung from one of the trees in the side yard. I got out, grabbed the pizza, and slowly walked up to the house. I tried the doorbell, which was glowing, so I figured it worked. No one answered, so I tried knocking. Again, nothing. Eventually I got creeped out, so I started walking back to my car. Halfway to my car, I heard, psst, and turned around to see an old man with wild and unkempt hair, literally peeking his head out from the back of the house. It was getting dark out, and my patience was draining, so I was not in the mood for someone playing games. I simply said, did you order this pizza, and waited for him to answer, but he ducked back out of sight. I started to just turn to leave but then he peeked out again. I said, Sir, is this your pizza or not? And finally he emerges. He walks up to me carrying a shovel of all things. He said, Yeah man, sorry, I'm just messing. I don't mean nothing by it. To which I just responded with the total and held the pizza out. Luckily that was the end of the transaction and I was able to get out of there. I worked the same job for a few years and had plenty more weird experiences, but I then moved on to find something better and safer. If you work delivering items to people at their homes, stay safe and never go inside their house. It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. The non-profit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms and drinking was not allowed on site, nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So, I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend, where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact, that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay during the DNC convention of 08 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning, and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank across the city most of the day. By about 1am, we got back to the hotel. The room was typical with two queen beds. Bed number one was close to a big window looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door slash entryway to our room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4am. My wife was laying at the head of bed number 2, flipping through the TV. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number 1, staring out the window as we talked. As we talked, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I assumed it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by and I thought I heard movement again, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. No, she replied. I thought I heard a door. I said back to her, with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said, breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quick. 
Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out, and I wanted to believe I wasn't seeing it, but there was a man dressed in all black with a black baseball cap pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room, and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone and hadn't been for a while, and he knew we spotted him. Eventually Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway, and he said, Hey man, is there something we can help you out with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little into the light and made eye contact with Tim and I. We all just stared at each other. Then eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. He stared at us for a while longer, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in a stairwell, but they directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk and they told him he was not a guest. He was apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then, a while later, they told my wife he disappeared and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They told her there wasn't even a room 1709 in the hotel. We got three different stories. We still have no idea what that was all about, or how he managed to get a keycard to our room. We were sure the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life. Always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. We should have sued, but we were young and dumb. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos, as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Dixie Busby, Michelle Green, Misty Rakur, Michelle Brooks, Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindop, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z. Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura C.A., Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marciana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D., Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Kelly Townsend, M., Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Lowe, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madiza Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, 
Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanagh, Tiara Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Plays 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lily Pan, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Ardiver, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona Xbox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoat, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absent Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.